music worldwide. I'm not doing anything crazy. <laughs> hey. How are you? I'm good, you know, just just chilling. Where where are you from, Stacy? Um, going live with Lisa Viola now. Jeez, what's this on the TV? End dubs, you know. Remember end dubs. <laughs> Hello. Oh, you added me. That was quick. Lucky I was doing anything crazy. <laughs> How, How are, you? are you? I'm good, you know. Just just chilling, drinking some um, uh, turmeric tea. Drinking? Well, it's like 8 p.m. here, so. Not not not, 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 Well, you got the wine. I've got I've got turmeric tea, so it's um. It's only one o'clock here, so I've just, you know, I've been up. Shimmeric tea. Yeah, bit of ginger, keep the immune system flowing and that. Good, good for you. That's it. Work that immune system. Mm. I'm, kind of in the, I'm in the middle of dinner. Yeah, we you say you're cooking. You're multitasking. I'm, I'm multitasking always. I promised to make the boys jollof rice today. It's my first time making jollof rice. Oh, really? And um. Yeah, so I've just got their second serving of chicken coming. Mm-hmm. Boys, right. you guys want to grab it? It's ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. First time making jollof. Oh, that's that's. You're gonna enjoy it. I'm a big jollof rice maker, so uh, you know, just. How do you how do you make your jollof rice? Well, my my jollof is um. Let me see. So I've obviously I've got my I've got my red onions. Got my strong red onion. That's essential. I've got my uh, my pill plum tomatoes. You know, gotta make sure they're really good ones. A good tomato. Um, I've got my puree. Making sure that puree is nice. Also, all ready for the bowl. I'm gonna fry the onions with the puree. Get that nice little paste and texture. Get my pill plum going real strong in the blender. Get that nice blend. Some good peppers, of course. And definitely gotta make sure that rice. Is um very very I would say separated and you know clean rinsed a lot so it doesn't stick too much you know so the jollof rice is not coming out like water rice you know right <laughs> so, you don't want it mushy yeah you don't want no mushy rice around there you know Ghanaian style that's, Ghanaian style no mushy rice yeah that's my biggest like it's got to be like grainy and separate yeah. so I'm I'm happy I feel like I added a little bit too much tomato. But my brother's safety okay. thing, it's okay. Um, and it's definitely not mushy. So that was my biggest thing. I just didn't want it to be mushy. It had to be grainy and nice, oh, like, nice texture. So I'm oh. happy with my first. That was my first time making it. Um, oh. So, yeah. How are you? Are you making it in a bowl or a rice cooker? Sorry? Are you making it in, like, a traditional bowl or a rice cooker? Um, Just on the stove top, like on a normal yeah. saucepan. <laughs> Okay, cool. That's that's Is that's that right? more. Yeah, yeah, but some people Can you make, make it in a, a rice, rice cooker? cooker. You mean like a rice cooker, cooker. like an Asian yeah, rice some, cooker? Yeah, yeah. Some people do it that way, but I prefer on the stove to be honest. So I can give it, you know, give it texture, give it a feel. Yeah, like I I cooked like the onion and everything, like you know, sautéed all of that for a good fifteen minutes before I even put the rice in. So yeah. definitely couldn't have done a rice cooker. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so what do you use? Um, some pe- do, you, do you eat meat? Yeah, okay. I don't eat a lot of red meat, I eat like mainly chicken and fish. Okay, well, tra- well quite traditionally, I would say in um, in Ghanaian culture, um, we, we tend to add some corned beef inside the jollof rice as the rice starts to you know evaporate and grow. We tend to mix just some corned beef to give it some you know. Give it that kind of flavor. So corned beef to the onion to mix nicely, that kind of thing. So that's a good thing that if you, if you eat meat and you like a bit of beef, you can add some, some corned beef, you know, to it. Right. And that's funny because I was just saying to the boys, I was like, I'm pretty sure when I had, because my best friend Michelle makes really dope, really dope jollof rice. And I was like, I'm pretty sure when Michelle makes it, there's chunks of meat in it. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. And then the recipe that I got didn't have any meat in it at all. So other than like chicken stock. So I was like, oh, okay. So yeah, I think you're right. I think, you, yeah, I, I can, next time maybe I'll try some corned beef. 
Mm. Yeah, you can run corned beef. You can run a. You know, you could even put a sardine in there if you want. Any any kind of meat, and give it a little <laughs> mixture. You know, I've done sardines, mackerel. Um, what else? Done? Prawns. You know, I've just just switch it up how you feel. As long as you know that you're not texture and that color, and you uh, you know what you're doing. Um, and after the first time you do it, you're gonna love it. You're gonna do it again and again. And jollof rice becomes a sta a staple dish in your household. <laughs> well, that's it. I was like, you know, in Angola, we don't really do jollof rice. I think it's more like a West Africa thing. But um, I was like, I'm African regardless. I think every African needs to know how to make a solid jollof rice. So I was like, i got to learn how to make it. And it, I mean, it's not that hard. It's just a matter of getting the texture right. And I, and I feel like any rice, it's all about the texture. So. Yeah. I definitely when you when you got it on the stove, you just gotta make sure you keep your eye on it as well. So I, I what I would do, I would come back every twenty minutes, um, just to kind of see how it's going, you know, give it a little, you know, a little down little doubts. <laughs> so you know, sometimes maybe exactly. add a little, you know, extra pepper, you know, in that comes a little season, yeah. season, yeah. taste on. And you know, who, you know who inspired me? Do you know Sherry Silver, the dancer? Oh no, I know now, Sherry Silver. Jerry, check her out. She's like, she's an African girl. She's Ghanaian. I believe she's Ghanaian. She's doing a lot of really big things. Um, I think she, she choreographed a um, a piece for, what's the guy's name? Oh, I can't even remember now. I have these mind blanks. Anyway, I'll think of it. Anyway, she's choreographing a lot of big, you know, film clips and awards ceremonies and stuff. She's an Afro dancer and she's doing a lot of stuff in the States now. Um, anyway, so I, w I followed her and she did this little mini, um, you know, like kind of cooking tutorial, but she dances through it and she's like dancing and like making food and I was like, that is so me. And then um, I was like, yeah, she's making jollof. That doesn't look too hard. Let me just, let me just make some jollof rice. Because it's like such a jollof rice war in the African community. Like everyone's always talking about who makes the best jollof, blah, 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 blah. So I was always a bit scared and apprehensive to try and make it myself. But yeah, I did it. Now, Lisa, you've got this. I believe in you. I've got so much faith in you. Your jollof is going to be incredible. Well, it's done. It's there. Do you want to have a look? Yeah, yeah, please, please show me. Give me the exclusive. <laughs> to the jollof My plate rice. is like half. I've got a plate here, but it's half like eaten, so I'm sorry. Because when you called I, or when you told me you were going online, I'd already started, started eating, but hold on, let me. Um, big shout to Sean. He said Nigerians make the best. <laughs> There you go. That's my jollof. Okay, cheese. Ah, uh, that's Bad. making me hungry, man. I'm hungry right yeah, now. Yeah, I got some chicken here. I got some broccoli for some greens. But yeah, the love, texture was well, not too bad at all. Very good. Very good. Looking nice. Looking tasty. Yeah. Cheese. So what did you? What are you having? What is it? It's morning there. So what are you having for breakfast? Um. Well, all I've had for bre I, I don't I don't tend to have breakfast, so I don't I don't eat anything until after uh, twelve o'clock. So right now, obviously, it's about one o'clock now. So I actually haven't had anything apart from uh, a matcha green tea in the morning, and now I've just had a turmeric tea, and um, now I've got to figure out what I'm going to have to eat a bit later. So I'll probably eat. Probably just have one one dinner now, to be honest. Maybe snack on some fruit and then just have some dinner. Um, but what am I having for dinner? Hmm. I think I'm gonna make something mad. Healthy. I'm gonna make a, a beetroot a beetroot pasta. <laughs> beetroot yeah. pasta. That sounds interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's quick. It's quick to make. You know, you just need a bit of beet. Uh, you know, uh, I would say a bit of cheese, a bit of feta cheese. And then you're good to go. You've got your, and sometimes a bit of dill, a bit of dill. I don't have any dill at the moment, so I'm gonna have to use a bit of salad or something. And I'm um, just yeah, just whip up a beetroot pasta real quick, and just have that in a little health kick. But Tuesday is the weekend, so I've got a little cheap carrot cake in the fridge, or so may have to Ooh, diet. <laughs> Are you vegetarian? Um. No, but right now I'm in, I'm I'm starting to implement a lot of that lifestyle into my diet. Um, I'm just educating myself, speaking to people, um, just everybody, just asking what they eat. Even in this, even in this talk, I'll probably ask you, you know, what are some of your favorite dishes? Because I'm just trying to pick up knowledge about 
try to stay around for a long time because you know, I don't want to, I don't want to like be eating my way to problems in the future. So yeah, that's kind of the way I'm, I'm feeling at the moment. Good, good, good. I think it's important. Look, I mean, I think life is about balance, right? You need to have a little bit of everything, but you need to know what good nutrition is. I think it's important to know it and then you can choose because I think a lot of people think that sometimes when they're eating something, they think that it's good and they're like, oh, but this is healthy. And you're like, well, no, it's it's not. Yeah. <laughs> so I think knowledge is power. So so long as you know what you're putting into your body and then you can, you know, when you need to be good, when you're you know, becoming ill or you're just, you know, going through a healthy phase or, you know, whatever it may be, you can really focus on getting your, your nutrition right. Um, but, you know, I think it's also something with like nutrition is always evolving because they're always finding out new things there's always new data coming out there's always new research um so and really i think it depends on what works for the person yeah well what would you say what would you say like um your favorite what's your top three food that you eat for yourself to um you know keep being as beautiful as you are what are the three top foods <laughs> I know this sounds really boring and, and, and plain, but porridge. Okay. I feel like porridge, like oats in my system is always really good. So I have a really simple porridge. Like when I'm being really good, I start the day with porridge, like fruit, a piece of fruit, and then I'll have porridge um, and just with like some cinnamon, um, a little bit of honey, just keep it really, really simple. If I'm being like extravagant, I'll add some dates and add some sunflower seeds and oh, some chia okay. seeds and you know, do all the high nutrient, nutrient rich foods. Um, but on a regular day, I'll just keep it simple. Cinnamon, honey. Um, and then for lunch, um, I find eggs are great. Eggs are good, like, feel good for me. Um, and then fish and salads and broccoli, um, lots of green. I know when I was in my like real training, back in my training days when I was just dancing, um, and I was really trying to keep my body fat down and just trying to keep lots of lean muscle. Um, I really stuck to leafy greens, even uh, fruits. I would only eat fruits that were green. It's okay. always about trying to keep sugars down, yeah. Um, no processed sugar at all. So if I'd had a, a sweet craving, I would have like a teaspoon of maple syrup or honey. So whenever I was getting sugar in my body, it always had to have a nutrition, like a nutritional element to it. So it was never just sugar. Um and yeah, but you know, these days I try and balance it out. Like I had a time there where I was being really crazy because I had to, you know, I was dancing at an athletic level, you know, um, or else now um, I'm not doing that as much. You know, I dance mainly in my shows. And so if I'm trying to cut down, <laughs> my brother's on live and I can hear myself talking. <laughs> He's tuned in. Hey, bro, I'm right here. Um, yeah. yeah, so these days it's all about balance. Like I, I eat I eat my junk food. I love, you know, especially, and it's not good, but, you know, when I get a little bit emotional or a bit stressed, yeah. I go for my chocolates and have some wine. Are you are, are you a dark chocolate lover or, or, or just like normal chocolate? I'm a big, I like dark chocolate. I'm a big dark chocolate man. Yeah, look, dark chocolate's, that dark chocolate's not bad. Um, I like all chocolate, yeah, but I can get, I can get a bit crazy. I can get a little bit too carried away. I find I'm either one or the other. I'm either going really hard, like with my bad eating or I'm being really good. I, I find it hard to find that. Yeah. Not gonna lie, yeah. What, about, what about you? Well, my cheeky treat, like, well, I'm not, um, yes, a couple of days ago, I bought, you know, Easter just gone. So, uh, I ended up. It was, they, all the Easter eggs are discounted, so I got like a cheeky um, caramel um, dairy milk Easter egg, one with a small egg, so I just got through that yesterday, actually. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I said balance is key, right? Balance is key, doing a bit of training and stuff. Like, um, obviously, it's, this coronavirus has um, been a bit crazy. Uh, how are you? How are you feeling right now, being on lockdown um, look, I have my days, like some days I'm like, yeah, great, so motivated, like all good, and then other days it's like, oh, this is just so shit. Um, I came back because, like, as you know, I usually live in Sydney and my family's from Perth, so I've flown across the country to be here. 
um, which is, you know, there's some pros and cons. Obviously, I'm living out of a suitcase and it's been like four weeks now and I'm like, oh, my God, and I'm missing my own home and my own space and my own suburb and just having, like, you know, my Sydney lifestyle. Um, but at the same time, I'm loving being home and being close to the family and, you know, having some quality time because the last 10 years I really haven't had that. Like, I've had short trips home, like four days, five days. Um, when my youngest niece was born, I came home for three months, and that's the longest I've been home for yep. 10 years. And wow. you know, I like, to, Yeah, I like to think our family are reasonably close. You know, there's only really my immediate family here. The rest of our family is in Angola. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been nice to just s stop and just not really do anything. I mean, I'm still working from home. I'm still, you know, being creative and doing all my all my stuff, but it's just nice to be home and not have that pressure of needing to get projects out or needing to book shows or do anything. It's just like, well, we just need to sit back and wait <laughs> and see what's happening. So, yeah, it's yeah, been good. Cool. So glad you're well and that you're in good spirits. <laughs> so now, you're originally, you was born in Angola, right? Yes. So um, just, just tell us briefly about when you came to you know Australia and how was it growing up in Angola for you? Was the music influence you know strong from Angola for you? Break that down for us a little bit. Okay, well I left Angola when I was four years old, nearly four. We moved to Europe for a year and then we moved to Australia. So I was very young when we, when we came here. I was about five years old. I basically went straight into school. Um, the musical influence, like, I didn't really, didn't really grow up listening to much like traditional Angolan music. My mum listened to a lot of like Brazilian music, a lot of like Portuguese speaking music. Um, and she was quite worldly, so she listened to music from all over the place. Like we always had all sorts of music. Um, but Afro, Afro music really became a thing for me. Like I always just loved the rhythms. Like it always just felt nice to me, but it wasn't until... I've got a few of my friends on here. Hi, Sheldon. Um, it wasn't until, like, I, I moved to Sydney. It was, like, 10 years ago. And I remember, because Perth, when I moved here, was very, very white. <laughs> There's no really other way to say it. Like, yeah. we knew, when we first moved here, like, we knew the entire African community. Like, there was, like, six other families. That was it. And we would all catch up. And there was, you know, my auntie Raki was from Mali. It was easier there because there was like a bigger African community. You're originally, you was born in Angola, right? Yes. So um, just, just tell us briefly about when you came to, you know, Australia and how was it growing up in Angola for you? Was the music influence, you know, strong from Angola for you? Break that down for us a little bit. Okay, well, I left Angola when I was four years old, nearly four. We moved to Europe for a year, and then we moved to Australia. So I was very young when we, when we came here. I was about five years old. I basically went straight into school. Um, the musical influence, like, I didn't, we didn't really grow up listening to much like traditional Angolan music. My mum listened to a lot of like Brazilian music, a lot of like Portuguese speaking music. Um, and she was quite worldly, so she listened to music from all over the place. Like, we always had all sorts of music. Um, but Afro, Afro music really became a thing for me. Like, I always just loved the rhythms. Like, it always just felt nice to me. But it wasn't until... I've got a few of my friends on here. Hi, Sheldon. Um, Sheldon. It wasn't until, like... I, I moved to Sydney. It was, like, 10 years ago. And I remember... Because Perth when I moved here, was very, very white. <laughs> There's no really other way to say it. Like, yeah. we knew, when we first moved here, like, we knew the entire African community. Like, there was, like, six other families. That was it. And we would all catch up. And there was, you know, my auntie Raki was from Mali. My auntie Getty was from Kenya. You know, I had friends from Zimbabwe, friends from South Africa. And it was, like, that was it. Like, we didn't have any other.
definitely not mushy. So that was my biggest thing. I just didn't want it to be mushy. It had to be grainy and nice. I'm going to do it again and again. Uh, jollof rice for comes Okay, cheese. That balance, right? You need to have a little bit of everything, but you need to know what good nutrition is. I think it's important to know it. And then I'm there where I was being really crazy because I had to. You know, I was dancing at an athletic level, you know, um, where else now. Um, I'm not doing that as much. You know, I dance mainly in my shows. And so if I'm trying to cut down, <laughs> my brother's on the way. I like to. Yeah, I like to think our family are reasonably close. You know, there's only really much of me. Like, they were all aunties and uncles, and they were all from all different parts of Africa. So we had that influence of, like, just – and we were all like, well, we're just one. We're all just black folk. <laughs> you know, there wasn't, like, this and them, you know. It was just like, if you were of colour, we're all sticking together because there, there wasn't that many of us at the time. Um, as I grew up, that changed, you know. It expanded, but uh, most of my girlfriends were all like from different nationalities. I didn't really have like my black like, black group of friends. You know, it was all just you know. And then when I moved to Sydney ten years ago, nearly eleven years ago, now that's really where I found my culture, I guess, because it was it was easier there because there was like a bigger African community doing things specifically for Africans. So African music festivals, African food festivals. You know, it was all. And then I got into African dance, and so I learned, you know, Ethiopian traditional dance, you know, the Esteksa, and then I learned um, um, South African gumboot dancing, Kwasa, Pansula, you know, and then it just all became, like, a thing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so that's when I, I felt like I really connected more into my African roots because all the women that I was around and all my friends were all African, different countries, but all African, and it was more about, raising up Africa and at the time we were having a lot of trouble here in Australia with the African immigrant community we had a lot of Sudanese come over you know when they had their war and there was just a, a really bad I guess um, representation happening in the media of African people and so it w became for some of us you know that were in the entertainment industry we we're all kind of doing our thing we all kind of came together and we were like okay well we just don't want this to be the stigma attached to us because, you know, yeah, okay, there are some people going around doing their thing, but you can't attach that to every single African and we don't want the whole community to be represented like that. So then we went out and we made it a point to represent the African community in a, po in a, a positive light. So, you know, we just, we worked really hard and we worked really hard in the name of that. We were like, well, we're women of colour. Or men of color and we want to represent and we want to show them that you know like it, it, it ain't like that for all of us and you can't put us all in a box and you can't put the stigma on us like it's not going to happen so we were just out there like we were doing movies we were doing tv shows i was dancing for artists i was touring i was just like going hard and we had like an all african girl dance crew and um, I always had done music. I, I've been writing songs since I was like eight years old. I always knew that music was eventually what I was going to do. Um, and then when I had the opportunity to do that, I worked with some guys from Jamaica um, and I was still on the dance crew. And yeah, so that was it. It was just like, that was our purpose. We just really wanted to, and my love for Afro, and then the Afrobeat things that was bubbling under the surface. You know, that's when DeBange was coming out. He did like, um, yeah, Oliver Oliver Twist, you know, and all of a sudden the world was looking at Africa like, oh, okay, okay. You know, the Gabido, the Skelly Woo, you know, like, and there was all this stuff coming out, it was bubbling, but it wasn't mainstream. And we yeah. were the ones at the, at the events dancing to this music, like spreading it, like, yo, this is the shit, this is the next wave. And I remember back then people were looking at us like, what is this shit, you know? <laughs> they were like, nah, this is it, this is, this is where it's going. And then there was the dance hall and the dance hall is, you know, there were a couple of like breaking artists like Shaggy and Sean Paul, but that dance hall was still really underground. <clears throat> so we were just like, that's what we were dancing to. That's what we were making music to. That's what we loved. And then Afrobeat became its own thing. So, you know, but even to this day in Australia, we still have dance hall Afrobeat events combined, you know, or reggae dance hall Afrobeat events combined because we just don't have enough, I guess. To, for it to be separate so yeah and that was just I was just like that this is my lane like we needed more females to represent too because there would be like a bunch of like three or four male artists opening for a big act and they wouldn't have a female act and I was just like well let me just fit right in here and that's how it that's how it was I know that was a really long-winded answer 
No, no, that's good. That's a good. great insight. And um, you, speaking of, you know, Afro beats and dance or uh, you work with some, you know, I was saying in your, in where you are in the world, uh, when I come across your music as someone who does a music worldwide show, I was very intrigued about how you was representing in um, Australia. And then I, I obviously doing research, I realized you was African as well. So I was very intrigued and always kept a close eye online on what you was doing. I'm supporting some of your songs on radio. Um, yeah, yeah, really. I feel like you're definitely a, a, a noble representative, you know, of your 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 community in the world of Australia, and you're doing your thing worldwide. And you work with some some big international acts such as um, Shaggy. Um, how, how was it? And how did you end up linking up with um, someone of that, you know, musical expertise? Someone like Shaggy, you know, a big legend in the dancehall community. How did that one come come about? You know, it's really funny. Like, I would never say that I was, like, a huge dance hall or reggae fan, which I feel bad having to say that considering the connections that I've made in that world and the opportunities that I've had in that world where there are people that have lived off reggae and love reggae to the core and, like, know everything about it. And the opportunities that I accidentally came across, <laughs> I feel guilty <laughs> because I remember my first tour and being like, I had no idea. And these guys were, like, schooling me on Jamaican culture, on patois, on the music and the history. And I was just like oblivious. And I was literally like, I'm sitting here with like reggae royalty being schooled on like, like the whole thing. So um, it was just, a, it was an accident. It was an absolute accident. My first track I had done with um, Red Fox, who was like a pioneer in dance hall. And that was through a friend. So a friend of such a long story. A friend of mine was touring with, who was he touring with here in Australia? Maybe it was Maxi Priest. Oh. I can't remember. Yeah. And so a friend of mine linked with his bass player, who's Taddy P. And she, and she's like one of my best friends. And her and Taddy P became like, you know, best friends that were talking every day. So I would be with her and she'd be like, hey, say hi to Teddy. I'd be like, what's up, Teddy? And him and his Jamaican patois, well, you know, and I'd be like, hey, hey. And then one day she said, oh, you know, and he, and he knew of my dance crew and all the stuff that I was doing. And then one day my friend said, you know, this girl can sing. And and he was like, really? Let me hear you, you know, send me some stuff. So I sent him some tracks and he's like, you know, you're all right. You can hold a shit. And I was like, yeah, you know, I do my thing. And so he's like, look, I got this track. Like, do you want to do it? And that's literally how that started. And Red Fox was on the track because he doesn't sing. He's a bass player. So that was my first. And it was a dancehall track. And that was literally my first. And like I said, Red Fox is like a pioneer in the industry. He's a, um, a writer for Shaggy. He's, you know, so he's written some of, you know, Shaggy's huge hits. Um, and so I did the track with um, Red Fox. And then I ended up take like the year after I released that track I was like you know what I need to get out there in the world and, and learn and meet and mingle so I booked a um, six country trip riding trip and my first in the Jamaican wow. world because he like, he played bass for everyone so everyone's like hey what's up Maxi what's up you know and I was like cool and then when I went to New York I linked with um Red Fox, who at the time was recording at Shaggy Studio, because it's called um, The Ranch. They all would go there and create songs. So he's like, come through. I'm like, sweet. So there I am at The Ranch with all the Shaggy's writers, all of them. Music worldwide on Dan Blake TV on YouTube. Red Fox, who at the time was recording at Shaggy Studio, because it's called um, The Ranch. They all would go there and create songs. So he's like, come through. I'm like, sweet. So there I am at The Ranch with all the Shaggy's writers, all of the, like, Grammys and all the, like, gold records on the wall and I'm just there like <laughs> okay <laughs> and then I went to Sweden while I was in Sweden I got a phone call from Taddy saying yo um we need a backup singer for the Kamani Mali tour do you want me to put you forward and I was like yo I can't do that gig <laughs> and he's like no 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 I think you could and he's like I think this would be good for you like this would be this will help strengthen your vocals like you really need a good strong vocal gig so you can get out there and be able to do this live thing and I was like yeah I cannot because I was a singer but I would yeah, sing a little you know and then like harmonies and doing like supporting an artist is harder than lead let me tell you it's harder than lead vocals because you need to be on you know there and harmonies my my range like I needed to be top 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 and then I needed to be on the bottom like 
the range needs to be there. You're hearing, you need to hear all the, like, I was like, I don't know if I can do this, but he put me forward to Kamani and Kamani was like, oh yeah, like, let's give Let's give her a shot. So they flew me to Miami and I rehearsed with the band. And that was literally my in. So once I worked with Kimani Mali, like we did a, a, I don't know, it was like a 15 country tour. Like at every festival there was someone. So I met everyone. And that's where I met Shaggy. I met Shaggy in Germany. Wow. And I was Kimani back. Wow. And the record, if people, you know, want to check that one out or haven't checked out already, it's called Show Me The Way, correct? Yes. Show Me The Way. Yeah. Um, so, um, just to let people know, where can they um, stay in touch with you? Is it linked to the Instagram, what about your social medias, your Spotify, all of that stuff? Yeah, well, all the music's on Spotify, iTunes, basically all of it. Um, and then I'm on Instagram a lot. I do have a Facebook page, but I've, yeah, Instagram's like my go to. Um, so, it's just at Lisa Viola. You guys can see it here. I think most of the people, I think a lot of the people in here are like, my people too, so they and, know. Uh, they know us. And also, uh, you're, you're one of your latest records. Um, I was playing on the radio, and I was supporting Lo Loyal. Yes. Just, just tell me about that record, Loyal. Um, obviously, it's self-explanatory, kind of in the book. Um, but yeah, it's why, very why, why did you write this record at this stage in your career? Like, what made you write this latest record? Um, I wrote, this record, I wrote this record four years ago in Sweden. Okay. Wow. So it wasn't like a current, it wasn't a current thing. I have an archive of music and sometimes I'll go through it and be like, I really fucking like this record. Why didn't I ever put this out? And then I'll do it. <laughs> and so I feel like as an artist, and I don't know if this resonates with other artists, sometimes when you're in the project and you're making it, you start to hate it. You're like, oh, maybe it's not as good as I thought. You go through these ups and downs. Oh, I love it. Oh, I don't know if I really like it. And then you kind of have to shelve it and then come back to it and go, oh, yeah, actually, that was really good. That was one of those records where I did it. I loved it, but I was like, oh, I don't know. I shelved it. And then literally four years later, the producer who did the track contacted me direct because I was working via a label. And that label was a hot mess at the time and there was – there's a bunch of stuff going on. And this, this this is the other downfall of the industry. Sometimes it's not always about, which is a shame, it's not always about the music. So many things can happen between writing a record and releasing a record. And sometimes you can have the hottest track, the hottest, hottest track, and it's just sitting there because you can't get the producer to finish it. You can't get the producer to release it. There might be some bullshit going on with the record label. You just don't know what's going on and you can't have access to it. You can't take it because there's co-writers involved and they don't want it released or whatever it may be. It might be a hot mess. And this was one of those situations where it was sitting there. I'd written to an instrumental. I didn't know who the producer was because I'd worked via a label. Um, and then they were kind of a hot mess and I like, loved them to bits, but it was a bit of a hot mess. I didn't really know nothing that I'd written on that writing trip was ever released. And then four years later, now that the producer's released from whatever he had going on with them, he contacted me direct. He's like, look, I just want to let you know, I was the producer of that track. I would love to release it with you. He's like, did they have a hand in writing any of it? And I said, no, not at all. They handed me the beat and I wrote the entire thing. And he's like, well, let's do it. And so we did. Okay. And um, so Lawyer was out now. If people want to get that, make sure you support that. Um, also, so... What have you got coming next? And when we get out of this quarantine, what was, you know, your musical plans for 2020 um, to 2021? What have we got coming immediately after? Or not even immediately, but at some stage this year. What have we got coming musically? And is there any features that you can let people know about right now? Give us some <laughs> Firstly, I never let any features, I never talk about features because you just don't know what's going to happen, whether it's going to, eventuate or not because people have all their different projects and they have their own record label deals and whatnot so i can't talk about any of that but i can tell you that i have a bunch of stuff in the works um i have i had found a producer that i really really wanted to work with when i was in atlanta this um earlier this year um and so we were starting talks about getting the ep together so that's all i can say <laughs> what's the name of the ep any name no name to be honest we're still trying to pick we're still trying to pick the tracks. I 
again, being an artist and being like in my head all the time, like just not knowing, okay, which direction am I going to go in? Because I just write. I, I, I am such a universal person. I'm from Australia, born in Angola, you know, like love my dance or love my reggae, love my Afro beats, love my Afro house. And it was just like, okay, well, what direction? And it just, right now it looks like a, like a bunch of stuff. And I, I, I need to channel it a little bit more, which is why I decided to get a music director and a producer in one that was would actually, um, you know, define the sound a little bit. And that's where I was at before quarantine happened. So, I, you know, we were in talks about getting it organised and, yeah, now it's just waiting and seeing what seeing what we can do. Well, sonically then, you know, you've got EP coming. Sonically, you mentioned, you know, African dance all kind of vibes and then the producers from Atlanta. So... I'm just thinking maybe some of his Atlanta influences may come on board. Um, what kind of stuff can, if obviously you don't need to let me know who the producer is or anything, but like just sonically, what kind of stuff is he making that you liked or what kind of songs that you know for sure that you're going to be messing with on this EP? Okay, um, that's a tough one to pinpoint, but what I can say is that the producer that I knew that I needed for my next project was someone that was really on top of the current sound, like a current sound. So Atlanta, all the hottest tracks are coming out of Atlanta right now. There's a sound, right? There's like... It's a mecca. Yeah. But I also needed an African producer who understood Afrobeat, right? And then I also needed a producer that understood pop music. Yeah. And let me tell you, that was really hard to find. <laughs> because I wanted someone that could do all of it and understood all of it authentically and was ready to give it the pop finish with the African swag, mm. but then re reinvent it so it sounded hot and now and current. So that's why it's been a while in between, in between EPs and in between releases because I just, you know, my definition and I think the definition of, 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 mad, of madness is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, right? So I just didn't want to put, I just didn't want to do the same thing this time. I wanted to make sure that it was all squared away. I've got a team in New York, got a team here. I just wanted to make sure that when we, co when we come out next time, it's like no bullshit. Like the marketing's there, everything's there, we're ready to go. And the sound is hot and it's unique. Wow. And um, that just brings me on to Perth, where you're from. Um, I need... On my on music worldwide, we do two things, and we always do this. Um, I need we do a thing called a language check. So you need to check in with me some slang from Perth, Australia, that you use that you can share with everybody right now, and that I can take and steal and use in the UK. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, nah. Yeah, nah. Yeah, nah. But it means yeah. yeah. It's like yeah, nah. <laughs> They say yeah, nah, a lot. Um, bloody okay. brilliant. Like, huh? Perth is Australian as it comes here. Everything is really Aussie. So, yeah, nah, yeah, yeah. nah, or the, yeah, that's it. Or, or bloody brilliant. Bloody brilliant. It's bloody brilliant when something's amazing. Um, wait, look, hey, guys. What's, what's, a real, what's a real Perth slang? Bloody brilliant. Yeah, nah. Yeah, nah. Bloody brilliant. Goes alright. Oh, goes, goes, goes alright. Yeah, goes alright. Like, oh, how, how does the car drive? Or what's the new car like? And you go, goes alright. Goes alright. Goes alright. Yeah, goes there you go. There's a bunch of them. There's a bunch of them. But it's so Australian. So what we call Ocker. Ocker. So, Ocker, huh? yeah. Okay. Yeah, so Sydney's far more uh, uh, universal and metropolitan, whereas Perth is very Aussie. <laughs> but you know what? Of all the places in Australia, like this is home for me, and I feel the most creative when I'm here. Wow! Amazing! Amazing! And um, yeah. also, if I want to visit Perth. As like you know, that means I would be a tourist. So, for the first time, so as a as a guest in Perth, we also link up. 
What's the first thing you're doing? What's the first thing you're showing? Um, first thing I do is I take you down to the Swan River. Um, there's the bell tower, Elizabeth Key. That's the, like the city, like the most beautiful. Um, that that would be the first thing. Love that. And now we do a, we do a thing. Yeah, this is like a, a new feature, and I'm calling it. Um, let me just get the title. Here. A part of you in two sentences. Twelve rounds of questions. Yeah. You ready? person that remember in two sentences you have to finish, finish, okay. finish, finish. all right two personality traits that attract you to a person okay um they would have to be kind and authentic two traits best advice given sorry Best advice given to me or that I'd give? To you. That's been given to me? Yeah. Um, that, in this, that in this industry, this is a bit raw, but in this industry, a man will either want to, one, sleep with you or two, make money with you. He'll never want to do both. Wow. Um, well, that's a man. Okay, let's move on. Most famous person you've ever met? <laughs> Most famous person I've ever met? Um, I've met a lot of famous people. But for me, I remember meeting Scary Spice, Mel B, and that was the most famous person to me because growing up, I loved her so much. <laughs> if you want to be my love, uh, the remix. Don't oh, yeah. I'm going to do the remix. Like, my love. Uh, <laughs> yeah. She was the first, yo. No one gives her enough credit, but that woman was the first naturalista. She was rocking her natural hair. Rocking her, like, yeah. dress. Yeah. That's it. She didn't care. She was out there. So I love her. And when yeah. I met her, I just about died. I met her twice, actually. Yeah. Oh, amazing, amazing, amazing. Um, a quote that you live by? Um, a quote. I don't really, I don't have a quote. Okay. Um, something that you stand by it. A sentence that you've done by then, something that you... Be, be, be kind, be kind. Okay. Your favourite movie of all time? Um, <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, it's probably The Lion King. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking love The Lion King. <laughs> yeah. The first You're one. The, the, the one that they just did was like, meh, the first one is my favourite. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> your, your, your number one hobby away from your craft of music? Um, ooh, I have a lot of hobbies. I like to sew. Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Never saw that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm going to send some stuff to you in the post. Okay. <laughs> um, the album to define your life on earth. Oh, a, a whole album. Uh, Actually, well, it can be a song. Be... Sorry? It can be a song as well, if you want. It can be a song. Oh, okay. Um... Oh, that's really hard. That, all of that's really hard because there's just so much music in my head always and there are so many different songs that define different moments so skip next <laughs> 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 the Spice Girls <laughs> there's supposed to be a prize if you get through this shit so like oh really said, okay Spice World Spice World because that's all like female empowerment and having fun that's all me so there you go Spice right. World I love that. Okay. What if somebody? What do you want your legacy to be? What do I want my legacy to be? Um, on on what level? Like on a any any level. Just what, any level. What do you want my legacy to stand for, or what do I want it to be? Yeah. What do you want it to stand for? What do you want it to stand for? Okay. What 
I want my legacy to stand for um, acceptance um, and love and kindness and just understand, like, we're all one. I think I, I feel that because I'm biracial and multinational in a sense of living and being from different places and embracing different cultures. So, and, and being that, sorry, it's more than two sentences, but sorry, being that makes me feel like I'm everyone. I see myself in everyone. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I would love everyone to feel that way. Yeah. Best joke you've ever heard. Best joke? Oh my gosh. I hear jokes. Oh my God. I'm surrounded by funny motherfuckers. Um, <laughs> Best joke I've ever heard. Oh, Lord. Uh, I and can't even remember. Okay. What makes you love the most? What makes me love the most? Laugh. Laugh. Laugh? Yeah. Memes on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh on my own all day long. I live for memes. I live for it. <laughs> and sarcasm. Fuck. Yeah. Give me one small confession and I'll give you one small confession. Okay. Um, confession that is something that I've done. Anything. Any small confession. And I'll dare one to say it's not cheating. Okay, a small confession. I confess that I shaved my legs today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is that a um, I don't know. <laughs> it's like the naughtiest thing I did today. <laughs> so, uh, my, my, my one is um, oh god, um, I got talk, I got caught talking to myself in the supermarket when I was trying to figure out what washing powder I was gonna buy out of two. <laughs> That's really cute. <laughs> I just looked like I was complete psycho by this person. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> same. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So, well, they were like, oh, this poor guy's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> well done, Lisa Viola. You took part in a part of you in two sentences. So, I've got a prize for you now. You ready for your, your prize? Yeah, you ready? Jeez. Yeah, you, let's oh. do it. Champion. There you go. Here's your trophy. Yay! Ding, 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 ding. All right. I love it. That's so cute. Woo! Can I put That's vodka a... in it? Hi. Yeah, go on, go on. Is there a little cup? <laughs> Just pour it in the drink. Oh, yeah. Perfect. I'm going to drink my vodka out of there. Done. <laughs> there we go. So good. Yeah, so Lisa, um, just give out, you know, your socials again so people can keep in touch with you. And also, um, if there's anything that you want to let people know before we before we cut off in the quarantine, quarantine message of hope. Um, no, that's it. Just thank you. I really appreciate your support. I will always support you and everything that you do as well. Um, I feel you. that my, my, you know, my success has been very slow and very organic and very from the roots up. So... Every single person that was there, like, plugging that first song, I will always love and and be grateful for. So thank you for everything you've, you've done. Love, love. <laughs> all right, all right. Love. Stay blessed, and obviously we'll catch up soon. Much love, man. Yes. Yeah. Have a great one. Bye, guys. Bye.